together. What do you think has made your collaboration with Ken Loach so, success so, so successful? In football. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, talk about the football. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the secret, isn't it? Um, uh, well, I mean, I think it's like any relationship, isn't it? There's a, there's a, there's a chemistry to it. And if you try and describe it, it falls apart. And, you know, I suppose, uh, uh, I suppose, I think you have to see the world in some similar ways. You have to be joined in the bit. So, you know, the big things we don't really need to discuss. You know, I think, I think those are things we take implicitly. Um, so, that's been very important. But what's also been very important is we have different jobs. You know, I write kind of regs, but we meet in the films, don't we? You know, and the, and the real joy of working with him, you know, is, first of all, he's a very tough collaborator, but a massive and generous one, you know, and he wants you, and he just wants to sit and show that he wants you to follow your instincts. So I get the total liberty when I write. That's very, very important. And then, of course, you know, when I, when I write this kind of play, we try to be our own toughest critics. And he's genuinely one of the guys with the least egos I've ever met in my whole life. And we just try and, you know, be our own toughest critics and, you know, try and solve the problems. And then, so, that's really, that's really, really important. And, and you never know how a film's going to turn out, but what you can do is enjoy the journey. And every single film that we've been involved in, you know, you meet all the people along the way. And I think that's nourished us both, you know, and then, so it's been, it's been uh, a mighty privilege to, to the to spend so much of that journey with them. And when you're developing um, mm. the screen, uh, the screenplays, where, when you're you're writing, right how much is Ken uh, Loach involved in that? Do you, do you share a lot of ideas and uh, how? Yes, yeah. yeah, it's, well, it's very organic. Uh, everybody thinks I've got the best agent in the world. Uh, I don't have an agent, and it's uh, and I think it's Ken from the very very beginning. He's had a massive generosity to the writer. Because he says that's where it all starts. Um, so he's always, he gives people confidence. And, uh, and like I say, we do very different jobs. But because we're so close, we're in constant discussion and debate, and it's very organic. And, uh, and so you know, we, we do decide that maybe a good subject you know, for, for, a, for a film. You know, I'll dig around and you know, I'll do a lot of research. Because you know, you've really got to try and understand the world of the story. You know, but you can't copy it from, from the street. So it's, it's a process of making connections and, and trying to build something in your mind and then forgetting it and then come up with, with, um, with the characters to tell a story for, for both of us. A good issue doesn't make a good film. We've got to, we've got to have a good story. You know, but, um, but how do you choose those stories? And that is really the biggest and most important question. So it's constant dialogue. So when I do write the script and I'll write that you know, by myself, we'll meet again together you know, to tear it apart and to ask the toughest questions. And well, so it's a constant series of discussions and then I'm with them there during the shoot when we do the casting. And at the end as well, you know, we look at the final cut. And it's been a debate the whole way through, so, you know, it's a real, it's a real collaboration. And, but like I say, we, we do very, very different jobs, and, but we respect each other's processes. And, and again, like meeting in the film, the, the, the filmmakers, and our loyalty is to the film. You know, that's the most important thing, you know, not whether you know, it's a nice bit of writing that you've lost and I don't care about that. And, you know, and then uh, the, the important thing is that it's the fact that it's the film. And it's, it's lovely to be working in collaboration with that. You know, and then of course, you know, being a director, then there's a whole other series of mighty collaborations with the DOP, the director of photography, you know, with Carol, with uh, Callan Crawford who does the casting with us. Uh, How close do you work with, with that? Yes, well, uh, we're, we're always there because, you know, you're seeing people. It helps you define the character as imagined in the script, you know, and, the, and you know, I don't think it'll be, be any spoiler to say that TJ in this film just now, which you're about to see, you know, he was a non-professional actor, he's been in two little, he was in two little scenes in Daniel Lake and Sorry Missed You, but he was a remarkable man, he used to be a fireman, he was in the fireman's union, he used to, he used to work in a pub, and um, but just speaking to him and listening to him, you can really sense a hinterland. You know, you could really sense his sensibility and his intelligence. You know, so when we do the improvisations and we do that casting, you know, you begin to, it helps you define your character. And, uh, and in this one, there's a particularly big casting, you know, because we have to, again, it's not spoilers, we just, there's such a big cast in this one. So that was six months hard graph for Ken, you know, and that's, uh, uh, you really do have to admire his work ethic. Because it was like you have to find the local kids in the community, 
and then you'd have to go to school, maybe get one person out of 40, and you come back home at 10 o'clock at night to get a Chinese meal. And if you're doing that for six months as a 30 year old, you get knackered. So to do it when you're 86 as he was then was uh, a really marvellous defeat. And, and again, it's a, I think it shows his, I think it was his political determination that got through him. He was absolutely exhausted. We were very worried for him, especially it was during COVID. And so it was such a relief to, to get through safely. Yeah. Uh, and you, you spoke about a bit of the, the costing process. Yes, sir. Uh, when you write it, is, uh, do you sometimes have characters uh, or actors in mind when you're writing and developing them, or do you keep that completely? No, no, no. Just, yeah, I, would, I would sabotage everything. I would find Yeah, yeah. It would just fall apart on that, I think. Yeah. I think you just have to just try and imagine the character. I think what Ken has always said is, in the casting process, if you get the script right, you know, which is you know, a big if, but if you get that right, the next important thing is the casting, and then, you know, he just says, we just try to find the people who will give it best flesh and blood as imagined, you know, so sometimes that is really remarkably experienced actors like Killian Murphy, and you just saw a clip of Killian, you know, in, in the Wind Sheets of Barley, there's another one with Peter Mullen, who won the Best Actor Award in Cannes, with My Name is Joe, I mean, people have great, great, um, you know, great experience. But there's also people like Paul Cranning and Angel Share who I met and just met out of prison. Um, and, uh, he's just such a smart, great kid. And I thought, well, this boy's special. You know, and you think, well, oh, he'll get a chance. The hilarious thing was, Ken came up from London twice to see him and he never turned up. You know, so uh, he was a bit of a scamp. And so I had to threaten him with uh, serious bodily harm and he didn't turn up for the third one. Uh, he met Ken for a cup of tea and, uh, and then it just blew his mind. You know, and he was a brilliant kid, and, uh, and it was fantastic for us. Carried the whole film, and uh, you know, so he came from the humblest and toughest background. I'm only saying this probably because he's done a documentary about it. It's not like I'm revealing the things that are private, but just a remarkable kid. But what was beautiful about Ken was, you know, he gave him a chance to carry a film. And if something like that crashes or runs off or, or loses his nerve, you know, uh, it, it, it was a disaster. But uh, he's been so calm in judging people. And I don't think there's another film director would have given someone like that a chance. And he's a brilliant kid and really remarkable. Martin Constant, Sweet Sixteen, that's the first time he ever acted. And, uh, and I hope you enjoy TJ uh, Dave's performance in this. Uh, a really lovely, humble man. You've been a screenwriter which has given a voice to marginalised uh, individuals, groups in society across your filmography. When you write a script about burning political and social topics, what do you think are the most essential skills for a screenwriter to have in order to make, to transform the story into a really compelling narrative which resonates with an audience? Um, that's a tough question. I don't know if I can really answer it again. Um, I, I suppose it's, it's got to live on the page. You know, the, the character's got to live. You know, it's got, I mean, the characters that um, excite you as a writer are often the ones with the, the often great contradictions. He did a film called It's a Free World, and, and there was a, a young woman in that, you know, who was an absolute, totally mercenary, ruthless character. And then, uh, but hopefully, if you watch the film, you understood her. So I suppose the authenticity is very, very important. I mean, the audience is just, I mean, I've got great respect for the audience's instinct and intelligence, so. You know, they can see through two dimensions. So you're always struggling to find those with that third dimension. And then and I think, you know, for example, like Daniel Blake, for example, was about it was how to view how to dramatise bureaucracy. I don't know if you've seen the film Daniel Blake, but it's a, the premise is quite simple, you know, it's a, an old woman with a heart attack and, and uh, it dies. And if he's pitched that to Hollywood, you wouldn't get very far. Um, <laughs> you know, so how do you how do you how do you dramatise bureaucracy? How do you kind of show the pain of it? And, and the, what for me is very, very important is doing the journalistic work, you know, and trying to understand the data connections. You know, so I spoke to people in food banks. And if you speak to people who are hungry and they, and, and they express their lives, they will, they, will, they will give you so many things, you know, things that you've never thought about. You know, what's it like to be sanctioned, to lose all your money, you know, for a month, three months, even up to three years? It doesn't only sanction you, 
It's also the family. What's it like to feed your children biscuits? What do you feel like that? If you spend time with other people like that and follow their lives, they will just give you so much. It's very, very touching. And also, what it helps you understand too is that the professional blowers are fun on that there who, who were then inside the Department of Working Pensions. And then you found out what the government said the public were absolute lies. And I found documents from whistleblowers saying that, you know, with the list of fellow workers saying you haven't carried out enough sanctions this month, and if you don't, you will be put on a PIP, a personal improvement plan. You know, this is the type of language, it's Orwellian. So then you know that this isn't just a bureaucratic, you know, mix-up, you know, on a big bureaucracy. This is systematic cruelty coming from above, a political decision by Cameron and Osborne, who are then in government, deciding to carry out sanctions and have demonised people on welfare. So much so that in opinion polls, people thought up to 30% of the welfare budget was fraudulently claimed. It was like 0.1%. So they scapegoated people on welfare, people who are sick, people who are vulnerable. Systematic cruelty by the state. I think they're up to the same thing again, and they're doing it now in our country now with, with immigrants and refugees in this barbaric, racist fashion. And, uh, and unfortunately, that seems to be happening all around Europe. You know, they, they look for a scapegoat to hide their own incompetence, to tell lies about them on a grand scale. There's a narrative to blame them for everything. And you see the same people doing the same thing again as the soul of welfare. You know, and it's, it's truly disgraceful to see just how, how barbaric and racist it is. Presentations, I talk too much about the film, I just about to see. So forget it. 